Hey everybody, welcome to the HTO channel. Thank you if you're returning. Um, thank you if you are brand new. Today we are going to continue with Exodus chapter uh, 7 over the weekend. Hopefully you had an opportunity to read Exodus 4 through 6. If not, you'll have time to uh, catch up. Remember, you're going at your own pace. I'm just as a guide coming alongside of you to just help you with your studying um, as we learn together. Um, before we do though, we're going to start out with a word of prayer. So I hope you are ready and got all your materials. If not, pause the video, grab everything you need, and then join back in with me. We are going to get started. And before we do, we're going to lay the foundation with the word of prayer first. And we are going to focus on our verse of the day. Our verse of the day will be found in Psalm 59 verse 16. Um, after reading this Psalm, I see that there are a lot of things that we, connections that we can make between what David was going through and Moses and Aaron in Exodus chapter seven. So hold tight for that and you'll be able to see as we look at this verse. It's coming from bible.com or in other words, you version. You can get it on your app or on, uh, on your computer. And it reads, um, when we get into the teaching, I'll give you more background, but for right now, let's just pray together. It reads, and I sing of your power and in the morning, I sing aloud of your loving commitment for you have been my strong tower and a refuge in the day of my distress. Let's read that again. I sing of your power and in the morning, I sing aloud of your loving commitment for you have been my strong tower and refuge in the day of my distress. And as I mentioned, we'll get some more background on that as soon as we get started. But for right now, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for all of those under the sound of my voice. Father, I thank you that you've allowed us all to see this day. Father, we thank you for the ministry of your word. Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for your loving commitment. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you that you've been our strong tower. We thank you that you've been our refuge in the day of our distress father we we thank you that sometimes even as we live in this world the things may be dark all around us but we have Elohim we have Jehovah we have the Alpha and the Omega the beginning and end the, the one who knows all things father remind all of us we thank you for this reminder even as we study today to know how great you are how great your power is how great your love is how much you protect us lead us and guide us God we thank Thank you for all that you do in our lives and we'll be so careful to give you all the glory we'll be so careful to give you all the praise we'll be so careful to give you all the the honor and your dear son god we pray this prayer meet everyone under the sound of my voice voice right where they are god with whatever problems issues concerns that they have god meet them just like you as we study through your word that you met the needs of the people of israel god you still meet our needs today. So we thank you and we bless you. We praise you for who you are. For it is in Christ, Father. And lastly, I ask that a song come up even in a, in a, within us, that we hear, we hear praise and we hear music and despite the circumstances, God. We, we offer up worship, God, despite the circumstances. We praise you now in Christ's name, amen start with the psalm of the day uh, we're going to become taking it from bible.com which is you version remember you can start this on your app or your um, on your actual computer just go to bible.com if you are on your computer and it is coming from psalm 59 16 and so before we get started instead of just dropping in in the middle of that or at the latter end of that uh, psalm let's just get some brief background uh, this comes from the Geneva Bible and it just says that it breaks it down by verse. If you ever want to look at the Geneva Bible on BibleHub.com, um, they use the treasury of scripture knowledge to give you a brief outline. Um, and so from the Psalm, we see, first of all, that this Psalm is, let's go back to this and you'll see, let me go to this, uh, read Psalms 59:16, and I'm going to go to the Amplified Classic Translation. Uh, let me see if that'll let me change it here. There it is. And Amplified Classic gives us a background. It's to the chief musician 
set to the tune of Do Not Destroy. Um, it's of David, a record of memorable thoughts when Saul sent men to watch his house in order to kill him. So we have the whole, you know, the background of this psalm, you know, this is, it puts it in context. And so um, this is from the Geneva Bible. And again, they just use the uh, treasury of, of scripture knowledge um, as their, as the actual background. And so it's David being in great danger from Saul who sent men, men to kill him in his bed praise to God. Let me read that again. David being in great danger from Saul who sent men to kill him in his bed, praise to God. He declares his innocence and their fury. He desires God to destroy all those who sin with malicious wickedness. Though God may keep them alive for a time to test his people, in the end, he will consume them in his wrath. This is so that he may be known as the God of Jacob to the end of the world. For this, David sings praises to God, assured of his mercies. And that comes from uh, the Geneva Bible. I'll let you take a look at that. That's also on Bible Hub. And if you see, look up here, they have used this um, from the treasury of scripture knowledge where you can break it down. Verse one is, is about David being in great danger then verse three, and then they list verse five. And so they give you an outline according the, to the verse. So I think that's a good um, translation that you can use the Geneva Bible on biblehub.com. I'm not sure. Again, you can look it up on what um, year, what edition it was. I think mine is either 1560 or 1599. I'm not sure. Okay, so, but we're gonna jump into the scriptures translation. You can use your KJV or any other translation to follow along with me. And it is 5916. Okay. And so again, this individual lament Psalm includes some aspects. So remember, keep that in mind. This is not, you know, like a joyful, I'm happy Psalm. It is, Hey, I'm in danger and I'm, I'm praying to God for some help. All right. So it says this individual lament psalm includes some aspects of a corporate lament psalm meant for group use. Though the psalmist mostly speaks for himself, his enemies affect his whole city as well. He asked God for protection and deliverance from his enemies who lie in wait for him. Why is this important? It's important because it shows that even in the Psalms, you know, we typically want to think of one way, but when David or any of the authors of the Psalms wrote, it was not always in, um, in, in, in an attitude of joyful praise. Sometimes these Psalms were written as laments, as a Psalm that we see today where he's fearing for his life. So let's continue reading. He then asserts his innocence and restates his petition. That's in verses four through five. That's if you um, maybe sometime today, if you have the time, you can go ahead and read the entire psalm. He compares his enemies to a pack of wild dogs. That's in verses six through seven. He is, expresses hope in God in verses eight through 10 and asks God to punish them in verses 11 through 13. He then repeats his description from verse six and verse 14 and elaborates on it further in verse 15 before concluding with a song of praise. So that's where we jump in on uh, verse 16. So if you'll turn with me in your Bible to Psalm 59, 16, and it reads, and I sing of your power. Now, before we do again, this is a, um, a song set to the tune of Do Not Destroy of David, a record of memorable thoughts when it Saul sent men to watch his house and to in order to kill him. All right, so here it is, David, after recognizing his life is in jeopardy, he says, and I sing of your power. And in the morning, I sing aloud of your loving commitment. For you have been my strong tower and a refuge in the day of my distress. Let me repeat that because I feel like um, somebody needs to hear that. I know I've had to, I've needed to hear a lot of words from the Bible, even this, 
let's repeat it again. And I sing of your power. And in the morning, I sing aloud of your loving commitment. For you have been my strong tower and a refuge in the day of my distress. So if you have a second, pause the video and just highlight power, highlight loving commitment, highlight that God, he's our strong tower and he is our refuge. And so our note says, I will hail your loyal love, or in other words, I'll sing of your loyal love. I believe, let's look at this in the KJV. It says, but I will sing of thy power. Yea, I will sing aloud of thy mercy in the morning. So if you have the KJV, it may say mercy for thou hast been my defense and refuge in the day of my trouble. So again, um, think of all of that. And so it says that the chesed love that the psalmist hoped for is now the object of his praise. And so if we just do a little quick word study on chesed, we see that it's translated steadfast love, faithfulness, loyalty, mercy, kindness. And then we see how all the different ways that it's translated. If you have KJV, steadfast love, the ESV, we have, I'm sorry, we have uh, ESV, KJV, we see mercy, we see loyalty, we see goodness, we see kindness. What does it matter? It means that it's just like it says that he has a loving commitment, he has mercy, he has favor toward us. Okay, and then if we just take a look at this in our um, Hebrew guide, it's called the ex exegetical Hebrew guide. And it just says here, 59, 16, I will sing a lot of thy mercy. So if I click on that, we see a form of that same word, C-H-E-S-E-D. Here we see H-A-S-D-E without the C, and we see mercy. And then we see that it can be defined as goodness and kindness and mercy. And if we look at the, um, uh, I forgot y'all, Lexham uh, Theological Word uh, Resource, um, we can see again, steadfast love, kindness, faithfulness, uh, loyalty. And it says the Old Testament frequently uses the term has said to denote an aspect of God's character as it relates to his covenant with his people. Perhaps the most well-known use of his said is found in Psalm 136, where the term is used 26 times as part of the refrain for his loyal love has said endures forever. Okay. And so this is just a beautiful reminder of the fact that God has loving commitment, faithfulness. He's our strong tower and he's a refuge in the day of our distress. And so I hope some of you, uh, read that today or receive that today. Just meditate on it, sit in it, sit in it, sit in it. Okay. So that'll wrap up our verse of the day. Again, that's Psalm 59, 16. Uh, maybe all of us can read the entire Psalm before we go to bed tonight. All right. So that takes care of our verse of the day. So hopefully you remember that I shared this resource with you before. If you go to digitalcommons.liberty.edu forward slash outline, you should be able to find this or you can type in Harold Wil Wilmington, Liberty University, uh, Exodus, and it should come up. Okay. So this is by Dr. Harold Wilmington li from Liberty University. He also has a book, a uh, Bible called the outline Bible. If you want to pick up a physical copy, it, I just, you know, I just, you know, think it's just awesome. All right. So we're going to look at, um, we're going to reload that site. Yes, we are. Uh, we're going to look at what we've covered over the weekend. Um, we were supposed to go from Exodus chapter four, all the way through Exodus chapter six. So picking up, we read about the proofs. We had the first proof and the second proof and the third proof. We have Moses's rod turns into a snake. Um, we should have all read about his hand becoming le leprous. The Nile river water will later become blood. That will be the third proof. Okay. And then we have the permission, the preparation and the plan. 
The permission God allows Moses's older brother, Aaron, to accompany Moses as a spokesman. Moses receives permission from his father-in-law to leave. Let me make this a little bit bigger uh, for you. And then we have the preparation. Moses says goodbye to his father-in-law. The plan, God will help the hand of Moses in performing miracles, but will harden the heart of Pharaoh. Okay. And then you, so you'll see that statement, harden the heart of Pharaoh in our reading, and you'll get more revelation of what that actually means. Now, um, in this section we have here, section four, uh, we have the mistakes of Moses. This is towards the end of chapter four that we've already read. We have the mistakes. For some reason, Moses carelessly neglected or perhaps even refused to circumcise his firstborn Gershom. We don't know. We just know that he didn't. OK, according to the text. Now we have the anger of God um, and then we have the act of his wife. You know, she says in some versions, some translations, you're a bridegroom of blood to me. OK, because she quickly circumcises her son because, you know, God's about he's upset with Moses. So we we've already read that. Then we had the meeting of Moses. That's when Moses met with his brother Aaron and he tells Aaron the details of their mission. We have when Moses then goes to the elders of Israel and upon hearing Aaron's message and seeing Moses's miracle, the elders believe them and worship God. OK, so that's where we're in four. And then we picked up in five. We have the liberation, liberating the people of God. And so we have the problems. And so we have a, a set of problems from two groups. We have a set of problems from Pharaoh and then a set of problems from the people. So in Exodus 5, 1 through 14, Pharaoh insults the God of Israel. And this is Moses to Pharaoh. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, let my people go. And then here's Pharaoh to Moses. I don't know the Lord and I will not let Israel go. And then Pharaoh increases. So that's a problem for Moses because he's going to increase, or we've already read that he increased the burdens of Israel. He forces them to gather their own straw to make bricks. So, you know, basically Pharaoh is saying, y'all are idle. And since y'all got time to come in here and complain to me, I'm going to make your workload even worse. You're going to gather straw and make the bricks and I'm not going to change the quota. OK, so that's the problem. So then we have the problem um, from the people, because after all this happens, upon learning the reasons for their additional burdens, the Jewish elders become angry with Moses and Aaron. Moses in turn complains to God. So we have problem from Pharaoh and problem from the people. So then that brings us to Exodus chapter six. We have the nature of the promise. Moses is reassured by God by the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that he will deliver them from Egypt and lead them into the promised land. And then we have the names. So then, you know, it, it kind of feel, you feel like you're jerked a little bit, but you're not. There is a reason I um, looked this up in the um, Preacher's Outline Sermon Bible. I thought it was a good way of, of seeing why we went into this record of the families of Reuben, Simeon, and Levi. The, the, the book or those verses are establishing the genealogy of Moses and Aaron saying that these, that they are from God's family. They are from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They are from these three tribes. They are, um, from these families of Reuben, Simeon and, and Levi, you know, despite what we know that all three of them have done. All right. So then we have the prophet. So that wrapped out, uh, chapter six. Then today, this is what we're going to get into in, uh, in, on today. Okay. We have part C, the prophet. Okay. So Aaron now is going to be appointed by God to serve as a prophet, as spokesman for Moses. So we're going to see, um, why, and then we have the power. So we have the prophet and the power. God will soon pour out his divine wrath upon the land of Egypt. Then we have the preliminaries up to verse 13. When Moses and Aaron will confront Pharaoh again, Pharaoh demands that they de demonstrate the power of their God. So Aaron throws down his staff, which turns into a snake. Pharaoh's magicians do the same, but Aaron's snake swallows up their snakes. 
and then we have the plagues now remember there are going to be 10 plagues but we're only in this in chapter 7 we are only going to cover the first one okay so because pharaoh will refuse to listen the lord begins a series of 10 plagues on egypt after each plague the lord gives pharaoh opportunity to change his mind but pharaoh continually refuses and so that will wrap us up we'll get to verse 25 where we will see the first plague and that's where Moses will strike the Nile with his staff causing its waters to change into blood soon all water in Egypt is polluted in similar fashion and then when we get done with seven we'll go into chapter eight not today and then we'll read uh, about the other additional plagues the frogs the gnats and the flies so that'll give us remember our tech our strategy is to survey before we even begin reading we take like a overall snapshot it's like when you go to the movie theaters they give you the trailer or you see the trailer at home in your house before you even go to the movies so that's what we're doing so y'all that wraps up our ser survey for chapter seven so here we are on our biblical timeline. Remember, we are reading according to BibleHub.com. If you're new to the channel or you're jumping in with us the first time, just go to BibleHub.com, type in the actual um, Exodus chapter seven is where we are today. Um, and if you scroll down, if you'll see a third layer, it will say uh, T-I-M for timeline. Click on that, scroll to the bottom, bottom and you'll see complete biblical timeline and from there you'll get to this page now for the rest of us we are in uh, according to biblehub.com remember we will find outlines or timelines that they differ okay so we've settled on biblehub.com so they said that this is happening the 10 plagues of egypt which we're going to read today that's going to cover chapter 7 through 12 happen at approximately 14 46 bc again that's 14 46 bc so if you look at from exodus 2 to about exodus 7 all of this is happening within the same year according to their timeline all the way through to exodus chapter we don't get out of 1446 until uh, we get to 1445 bc which is exodus 40 so all of the rest of Exodus, it appears, will happen all within that same year, 1446 B.C. So that's where we are on the timeline in case you want to do some additional research. Again, this is on BibleHub.com. Um, also, if you go to BibleHub.com and you type in Exodus 7 and 1 and you see this TSK, that's the Treasury of Scripture Knowledge. It's really helpful. At the top, you will see that if you want to find cross references according to the verse, they'll list the verse here. They have the verse written out. And then by phrase where it says, see, I have made you like God to Pharaoh. It says, see, so you could find cross references on the word see. And then it says a God. You, you find cross references on a God. But here's the part I wanted to show you. In your Bible, physical Bible, when you're taking notes, you can just go ahead and highlight and add these subtitles in. In verse 1, they're telling you what's going to happen. Moses and Aaron are encouraged to go again to Pharaoh. Verse 8, Aaron's rod is turned into a ser serpent. Verse 11, the sorcerers do the like. And then all the way from 13, 14, and 19. So I thought that that was a good tool that I wanted to share with you. Okay, so again, there's a brief chapter outline that you can use in the TSK. I've also showed you the other outlines that you can use. And that is, let me just quickly click on that. So you'll see, this is another outline for the entire book of Exodus that you can use. Okay, so if you notice, if I use the TSK, that really gives me a good outline of the chapter by verse. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. We are going to take a look at the uh, biblical map on where we are. We are located in Egypt. Um, and I thought it was interesting for us to take a look at an ancient biblical map. So if you do some research, you will be able to see this um, just any 
general uh, search of ancient biblical map, Egypt, Nile River. Okay. So if you look at this, you have what they call lower Egypt and upper Egypt. So I don't think this is going to us. Uh, there it is. If you want to get in a little closer. And so we see lower Egypt and we see upper Egypt and here's the Nile River. So that's where all of this is taking place. And then I thought it was interesting to go to Google Earth. If we go to Google Earth, we can actually see. Um, let's just type in Nile River because you have biblical maps and then we have our maps today. And so if you see here, there's Egypt and then the Nile. Let's go ahead and X out of this really quick. And if I just minimize this, you can see that we are on the continent of Africa, of course, Egypt. And then we saw the Nile River. So if we go in again a little bit more closer, you'll see the Nile River here. So let me just go ahead and hit that again. And then we can just see some nice photos of what it looks like. Um, um, it doesn't have a date, so I'm assuming these are still just um, more modern photos of the Nile River. So I just thought that was interesting um, to see, and you can just check that out in your own time. Let's just go on through to, there it is. Okay, so if we're ready, we're going to lean in and we're going to do our first and second reading. First reading, we listen by audio for those of us who are audio learners. Um, and then we'll also, and also you'll see the, the actual text. This will be coming from the Berean Standard Bible. Um, that's not the translation we will use for our study. It just happens to be the one that I feel that goes along really well. It has the Berean Reader's Bible so we can see the text without a lot of uh, distractions. So if you're ready, let's get started to lean in and hear our audio Exodus 7 chapter. So as usual, again, we use we are using a lot of the resources on BibleHub.com. When you go to SUM, you can get a summary of the entire chapter. So we are looking at Exodus chapter 7, the plague of blood, unyielding hearts and divine wonders, the Lord's miracles in Egypt. This chapter reveals the extraordinary extent of God's power and his commitment to the liberation of his people. It underlines the importance of obedience to God's commands and the profound consequences of hardening one's heart against divine signs. It calls us to heed God's voice, seek his will, and understand his mighty acts in our lives. I want to go ahead and highlight that. If you want to take a moment and just jot that down, heed God's voice, seek his will, and understand his mighty acts in our lives. And so let's see if we can highlight that. All right, so let's look at the breakout of verses. We have divine empowerment, verses one through five. Again, you can even just write this on the side in your Bible. Divine empowerment. God promises Moses that he has made him like God to Pharaoh with Aaron as his prophet. However, he also predicts that Pharaoh's heart will be hardened. Key word predicts. Breakout verses six through seven. Confrontation with Pharaoh. Moses and Aaron at the ripe ages of 80 and 83 respectively. So Moses is younger than Aaron. They obey God's command and speak to Pharaoh, presenting their first miracle. Okay, verses 8 through 12, Battle of Wonders. Aaron's staff transforms into a serpent before Pharaoh, a feat replicated by Egyptian sorcerers, but Aaron's staff swallows theirs. Verse 13, Pharaoh's hardened heart. Despite the miracle, Pharaoh's heart remains unchanged. First plague. As Pharaoh remains stubborn, God instructs Moses and Aaron to strike the Nile, turning its water into blood and causing all the fish to die. Mirrored miracle. Verses 22 through 23, the magicians of Egypt replicate the miracle, leading to the further hardening of Pharaoh's heart. 
And then we have the last two verses, aftermath of the plague. Egyptians are forced to dig around the Nile for drinking water, and seven full days pass after the Lord's striking of the Nile. The chapter unfolds as the Lord endows Moses and Aaron with divine powers, enabling them to confront Pharaoh. Despite the ensuing wonders and miracles, Pharaoh's heart remains hardened, leading to the Lord's mighty act of turning the Nile's water into blood. And so I want you to think about some things before we even get started. It says the Lord endows Moses and Aaron with divine powers enabling them. Okay. And I also want you to think about this when you think about today's times and how when a message comes, when you think about Moses, he's bringing God's message to Pharaoh, how that even in these times when the gospel comes, that many choose to allow their hearts to remain hardened, to be hardened to the move and the power of the Holy Spirit. All right, let's check out the themes in this chapter. Divine intervention and judgment, hardening of the hearts, power of obedience, display of God's power, confrontation between God and Pharaoh. What are the topics? God's reassurance to Moses, miraculous signs and wonders, transformation of Aaron's staff, the first plague, water turned into blood, Pharaoh's unyielding heart. Now, when you are studying, you can highlight or circle these people, Moses, Aaron, Pharaoh, Israelites, Egyptians, and the magicians of Egypt. And where is it located? In Egypt, and we saw on the map, uh, the Nile River. And so again, you have your Bible study questions where you can come back at the end on your own time. You know, don't rush through, do whatever you're led to do. Okay, and go through, pick a few questions. They are, I, usually there's 20. Yeah, there's 20. And you can just pick and determine which ones you really want to meditate on, think about, chew on, roll over in your head. Okay, so with that said, let's go ahead and get started with the reading for Exodus chapter 7. Exodus chapter 7. The Lord answered Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. You are to speak all that I command you, and your brother Aaron is to tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of his land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I will multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt, and by mighty acts of judgment I will bring the divisions of my people, the Israelites, out of the land of Egypt. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord." when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out from among them. So Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded them. Moses was 80 years old, and Aaron was 83 when they spoke to Pharaoh. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh tells you, perform a miracle, you are to say to Aaron, Take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh, and it will become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord had commanded. Aaron threw his staff down before Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a serpent. But Pharaoh called the wise men and sorcerers and magicians of Egypt, and they also did the same things by their magic arts. Each one threw down his staff, and it became a serpent. But Aaron's staff swallowed up the other staffs. Still, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them, just as the Lord had said. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is unyielding. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as you see him walking out to the water. Wait on the bank of the Nile to meet him, and take in your hand the staff that was changed into a snake. Then say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has sent me to tell you, Let my people go, so that they may worship me in the wilderness. But you have not listened until now. This is what the Lord says. By this you will know that I am the Lord. Behold, with the staff in my hand I will strike the water of the Nile, and it will turn to blood. The fish in the Nile will die, the river will stink, and the Egyptians will be unable to drink its water. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their rivers and canals and ponds and reservoirs, that they may become blood. There will be blood throughout the land of Egypt, even in the vessels of wood and stone. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded. In the presence of Pharaoh and his officials, Aaron raised the staff and struck the water of the Nile, and all the water was turned to blood. The fish in the Nile died, 
and the river smelled so bad that the Egyptians could not drink its water, and there was blood throughout the land of Egypt. But the magicians of Egypt did the same things by their magic arts, so Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said. Instead, Pharaoh turned around, went into his palace, and did not take any of this to heart. So all the Egyptians dug around the Nile for water to drink, because they could not drink the water from the river. And seven full days passed after the Lord had struck the Nile. Okay, guys, so here we are at Exodus chapter 7. Um, and remember, even if you don't have, this is Logos, but remember I've showed you a lot of tools that you'll be able to use on Bible Hub. I don't think there's a thing that you can, um, uh, well, I won't say that. I'll just say that in, on Bible Hub, you have a lot of resources available to you. Okay, so let's just start with Exodus 7. And where I have actually created notes, you can stop and pause the video and write down any notes that you think that you would like to add so that when you even study even further, you can just add your revelation insights from the Holy Spirit into um, one area for yourself for study. All right, so let's start with chapter seven. It says, so now remember the uh, translation that I'm using, I'm gonna be going back and forth, maybe between two or three trans translations, but primarily this is the scriptures translation. Um, and then you can remember, you can use any version. You should be able to follow along. It's just not gonna match yours word for word, but where I need to give you clarity, I will stop and do so. So it says so, and then remember we've already learned this. This this is the tetragrammaton yod he vav he. So that's where in most of our Bibles where they have written the title Lord. Remember, let me tell you, title, not the name. The name is yod he vav he, and we don't know how to pronounce it. So let me just as a quick review, let's look at uh. uh 3068, the Hebrew Strong's entry number, 3068. Over here, you will see the exegetical guide. And so if I click or hover, so and this is what the manuscript would look like over here, okay? That's written in Hebrew. We, I, Those of you, there may be those of you out there who know the languages, I don't, a lot, of, a lot of us don't. And so we use these helps just to kind of understand and look a little uh, deeper into the text. And so we have the Lord. And so if you notice when I hover this right here, this tetragrammaton with the um, vowel points at the bottom that was given so that they could, uh, would know how to pronounce the name. But eventually they just begin to write the word Adonai under there and not pronounce it at all. That's why, that's part of the reason why the pronunciation of his name is lost. Okay. So we see it's the Lord. That's what we would normally see in the KJV. And so if we scroll down, that's the tetragrammaton, Y-H-W-H. That's when we transliterate this Hebrew text into our English. This is what we get. Okay. Again, some believe that it's pronounced Yahweh. Some believe that it's pronounced Jehovah. Some believe that it's pronounced Yehovah. You'll, I believe that the pronunciation, I won't say pronunciation. I'll say according to Bible hub, the phonetic spelling of that tetragrammaton is pronounced Yehovah. So that's where you'll hear me say Yehovah. Okay. So when you see this, just remember that's the same thing as Lord in your Bible, or I will say, um, Yehovah. So again, it says, so Yehovah, and let me just show you just so you'll know and the Lord. Okay. So mine says, so Yehovah said to Moshe, in other words, that's Moses. That's the transliterate transliterated name for Moses. Let me show you that also again. So if I hover over Moses, that's what his name looks like in um, the Hebrew text. If I click it, you'll see the transliteration down here is M-O-S-E-H. So in my translation, they added an extra H. So it's Moshe. Okay. So it says, see, I have made you an Elohim to Pharaoh and Aaron, your brother is your prophet. Okay. So that's a loaded verse right there. I have made you an 
Elohim. If you were looking in the uh, actual KJV, it will say, I have made thee a God to Pharaoh. So another word for God is Elohim. Um, you can also think of it in this translation, it says, or mighty one. I've made you a mighty one um, to Pharaoh. So notice he, who God is saying that he's making a uh, God to. He's saying, I'm going to make you a God to Pharaoh. So let's just take a look at our note here. And we'll see when you see T-W-O-T, that is the um, theological word book of Old Testament words. I still got to pick that up if you want to pick that up on uh, Amazon. OK, and then let me just expand this so you can see this. And so this note is if we go continue on, it says rulers. Okay, you can ignore that. That's like my Alexa in the background. Sorry. Um, it says rulers, judges, either as divine representatives at sacred places or as reflecting divine majesty and power. So I believe that's a good definition of what that verse is saying. That Moses, that God is saying, Elohim, Moses, I'm sorry, God is saying to Moses, that I've made you a judge, I've made you a divine representative, and you will reflect my divine majesty and power. So I hope you get that. That is a loaded statement. So if we just read this and we say, oh, I've made you a god to, to Pharaoh, you know, we'd be thinking, okay, well, exactly what does that mean? But by looking up the word, we see exactly what that means. So here's a text note from the, uh, I believe this is the net Bible, the word like. So in some versions, it'll say, my translation says, I have made you an. There's some will say, I have made you like. And the KJV, let's scroll down. It says, uh, let's go ahead here. Come on, seven and one. It says, I made thee a God to Pharaoh. Okay, let's see what this says. And then this actual verse gives us insight. So if we remember, we read in Genesis, uh, I'm sorry, Exodus 4, 16, and he shall speak for you to the people. And it shall be that he shall be a mouth for you and you shall be an Elohim for him. OK, so we're seeing here that, you know, it didn't just get put in here in Exodus 7. We already read this in Exodus 4, 16. So let's go back. It says the a God. Some say in some translations like a God. My translation says uh, uh, let me go back. That's KJV. I'm sorry. My translation says I have made you an God. Okay. And so in the net Bible, it says like a God. So the word like is added for clarity, making explicit the implied comparison in the statement. I have made you God to Pharaoh. The word Elohim is used a few times in the Bible for humans. So that's what we're seeing here in our verse. And we can see Psalm 82, 1. It says Elohim stands in the congregation of El. He judges in the midst of the Elohim. And always clearly in the sense of a subordinate to God, they are his, here's the key word, they are his representatives on earth. So Moses is acting like a representative of God. The explanation here goes back to 416. We already saw that. If Moses is like God in that Aaron is his prophet, then Moses is certainly like God to Pharaoh. Only Moses then is able to speak to Pharaoh with such authority, giving him commands. That's from the net Bible. Now check out the, um, this is the preacher's uh, I forgot that quick outline in sermon Bible. I'm sorry. The preacher's outline in sermon Bible. Moses was to be God's messenger. He was to be as God as God to Pharaoh. That is, he was to be endued with the very power and authority of God. OK, so we see what that loaded statement means in that chapter. OK, in, in chapter seven, we're looking at just the first part of Exodus one. And then it says 
to Pharaoh and Aaron, your brother is your prophet. So in other words, it's almost like he's saying you're, you're going to mimic this relationship that I have with you. So you are a prophet of mine. And so you're going to be like a God to Pharaoh and Aaron is going to be like you. He's going to speak on your behalf. So that's what it's saying. So if we take, let's just take a look at our note here and we said it says a prophet. And so let's look and see. If we can, let's see here, y'all. Okay, let's see. We might have to pause for a second. I'm seeing uh, for some reason. Okay, it's working. Let's see here. Okay, let me pause for a second because I need to see. Okay, there it is. I'm sorry, y'all. I just want to make sure that this is um, not uh, stuttering at all. This first one is blank. The second one is what we need. All right. Thank you for um, bearing with me on that. So let's look at this term, the prophet. OK. And so if we look at the original Hebrew, it would look like this. The Strong's entry is five zero three zero. And the transliterated term from Hebrew is N-A-B-I or in other words, prophet. The word has a possible cognate in Akkadian. So in other words, a root. It occurs about 309 times in biblical Hebrew and in all periods. NABI represents prophet, whether a true or a false prophet. And you can check out Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5. True prophets were mouthpieces of the true God. So think about that verse. You know, he's saying that Aaron is going to be to you really like you are to me. And it says in Chronicles 29, 29, three words are used for prophet. Now the acts of David, the king, first and last, behold, they are written in the book of Samuel, the seer, and in the book of Nathan, the prophet. So we see that word in this verse, that's First uh, Chronicles 29, 29. And then it says, and in the book of Gad, the seer, the words translated seer emphasize the means by which the prophet communicated with God, but do not identify the men as anything different from, from prophets. Look at first Samuel nine and nine. The first occurrence of this word in ABI does not help to clearly define it either. Now, therefore, restore the man, Abraham, his wife, for he is a, we see that word in this verse, a prophet, and he shall pray for thee and thou shalt live. That's Genesis 20 and seven. The second occurrence of NABI establishes its meaning. And the Lord said unto Moses, see, I have made thee a God to Pharaoh and Aaron, thy brother shall be thy prophet. That's the verse we're in. The background of this statement is Exodus 4, 10 through 16, where Moses argued his inability to speak clearly. Hence, he could not go before Pharaoh as God's spokesman. God promised to appoint Aaron, Moses's brother, to be the speaker, and he shall be thy spokesman unto the people, and he shall be, even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth, and thou shall be to him instead of God. Okay. So we can see, um, what this means when we put all that together to understand that statement, you will be a God unto Pharaoh. Um, Exodus seven, one expresses the same idea in different words. It is clear that the word prophet is equal to one who speaks for another or his mouth. The basic meaning of NABI is supported by other passages. In the classical passage, Deuteronomy 18, 14 through 22, God promised to raise up another prophet like Moses, who would be God's spokesman. They were held responsible for what he told them and were admonished to obey him. However, if what the prophet said proved to be wrong, he was to be killed. That's Deuteronomy 18 and 20. Immediately, this constitutes a promise and definition of the long succession of Israel's prophets. Ultimately, it is a promise of the great prophet, 
Jesus Christ in Acts 3, 22 through 23. See that the prophet or dreamer of dreams might perform miracles to demonstrate that he was God's man. But the people were to look to the message. Check this out. Look to the message rather than the miracle before they heeded his message. In the plural, NABI is used of some who do not function as God's mouthpieces in the time of Samuel. There were men who followed him. They went about praising God frequently with song and trying to stir the people to return to God. So that's in a negative sense. Okay, and so we'll stop there, but you get an idea. Okay, so of how this word prophet in a B I let's go back to the to to the guide. If I click on that, you will see that here in a B I and that's just literally a spokesman that we have established. So let's continue with verse two. Man, that was just verse one. You shall speak all that I command you and Aaron, your brother, shall speak to Pharaoh. So he's he see here in verse two how it's also establishing that he is the mouthpiece or the spokesman for Moses. Okay. It says, and Aaron, your brother shall speak to Pharaoh to let the children of Israel go out of his land. Now, if you see Israel, just take off the Y and you'll see that's the same thing as Israel. Let me just show it to you in the KJV. In verse two, thou shall speak all that I command thee and Aaron, thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh that he send the children of Israel out of his land. Okay. All right. So let's go on, continue with verse three. But before we do, let's look at verse one. And this is the faith life study Bible in 416. God promised that Aaron would consider Moses' words as if they came from the mouth of God himself. Again, that's expanding on that phrase. You will be a God unto Pharaoh. The same idea operates here. Moses, Moses will act as a God to Pharaoh. So he's not only acting as a God to Pharaoh, he's also acting as in uh, Exodus 4, 16, as a God unto Aaron. Okay, so hopefully we have clear understanding on that. We talked about prophet. Prophet means a spokesperson. Aaron will serve as Moses' mouthpiece because of Moses's. How, well, let's just say this of what Moses is, Moses feels is his speech impediment. Okay. Um, verse three, this is the verse we're going to pick up right now, but I am going to harden the heart of Pharaoh and shall increase my signs and my wonders in the land of Mitzrayim. All right. So before we do, let's just look at this note. I will harden Pharaoh's heart. So when you first read that, and when I read that a long time ago, I was like, well, why would God, you know, can we really blame Pharaoh if it's God, if he's the source of the hardening? But that's not the case. So let's check out this note. As in the previous statement of God hardening Pharaoh's heart, that's Exodus 4, 21, where, where it reads, and Jehovah said to Moses, as you go back to Egypt, see that you do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I put in your hand, but I'm going to strengthen in this translation instead of harden his our heart so that he does not let the people go. Okay. So it says, we remember that God did, God did not harden Pharaoh's heart against Pharaoh's own desire. So in other words, Pharaoh had already had a heart that was hardened because he even says, you know, I don't revere. I don't know. I don't acknowledge this God of yours. Okay. God confirmed Pharaoh and his wicked inclination against Israel. Pharaoh revealed his heart when he refused the humble request of Moses back at Exodus 5, 1 through 4, right? Because, you know, uh, Moses goes to him and in 2 he says, and Pharaoh said, who is this God? Or in other words, who is Jehovah that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? So he's already got a hardened heart. So now God would harden or strengthen Pharaoh and the evil he already chose. Okay, so let's get this. God can do the same today. So here's the point. In our, or those of us, or not us, I won't speak over you and me, but there are people who have a heart hardened to the message of God, message of Christ even today. So in our rebellion, 
we may reach the place where God will strengthen or harden us in the evil we desire. Therefore, God also gave them up. This is a cross reference to their uncleanness and the lust of their hearts. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. See Romans 1 24 and Romans 1 28. That comes from David Guzik. Now from the fire Bible, it says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. God did not force Pharaoh to resist him. Pharaoh's heart was already hard toward God. Remember, we saw that in Exodus 5, 1 through 4. So when God confronted the stubborn, rebellious attitude in his heart, Pharaoh resisted even more. This additional hardening was a punishment for Pharaoh's determined rebellion and opposition toward God. See those verses. God was demonstrating a principle that applies to all who resist him and refuse to turn from their stub own stubborn way. There comes a point where God finally turns people over to the full effects and consequences of their sinful desires and actually hardens their hearts even more. People in this dangerous condition are often spiritually blinded to God's love and the truth of his word. God often allows this so that a person will come to a point of hopeless, hopelessness and finally turn to God for help and salvation. Notice how the judgments of these, the early plagues softened Pharaoh's hearts. We will see that when we can finish the, the actual all 10 plagues. But when God removed each plague, Pharaoh's heart hardened again. This shows that Pharaoh resisted God and hardened his own heart whenever God showed mercy. Okay. So now when we read verse three, I mean, it, you, when you just read it on the surface, it can appear like, okay, well, God is the source of his hardening. But now we can see with extra study that that's not the case. God is just doing what Pharaoh already had in his heart. Okay. And then it says, and shall increase my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. Verse four, and Pharaoh is not going to listen to you. And I shall lay my hand on, this is Egypt again, remember, and bring my divisions and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. judgments. And we're going to see that starting in this chapter by great judgments. And it says, and Pharaoh is not going to listen to you. So let's check out this um, note. But before we do, let's look at this note on verse three, the descriptions here. And in verse four, foreshadow the plagues that God will cast upon Egypt. Since the descriptions are plural, Moses should not assume Pharaoh will be quickly persuaded. See those verses. God will use Pharaoh's arrogance and stubbornness to demonstrate the superiority of his power to the magicians and gods of Egypt. Okay. So that's verse, uh, verse, uh, three, that's our note. And then let's look at some additional notes where it says he will not listen to you. So in other words, He's, I mean, he has a hardened heart. So this phrase, I shall lay my hand on Egypt. Okay. You will see in your KJV in verse four, it'll say that I may lay my hand upon Egypt. Okay. My translation says, I shall lay my hand upon Egypt and bring my divisions and my people, the ch children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. And so we're looking at this phrase, I shall lay my hand. So let's just go ahead and expand the note. And so we see here, it just means used with great latitude of application. Another word is avenge. Another phrase is deliver up. And God is going to do this without fail. And so even think of the word recompense, think of strike. Okay, so this is some serious business that's going to happen and we're going to see the reaction of Pharaoh. So if we look in verse four and it says here, I shall not, he shall not hearken unto you that I may lay my hand upon Egypt. And that's where we get that word right here. 
I may lay my hand. And so that's right here in a T A T I T A T T I. Okay, and so that's where I got that information from. And then it says, I shall lay my hand on Egypt and bring my divisions. So in yours, what it means in the KJV, we looked at, he said, bring forth mine, you should see armies. Okay, so if I go here, my and bring my divisions. So here again, if we expand the note, It's another word, and when we transliterate that word, it's S-A-B-A, -A, and it's a noun, and host or army. So that's why you see armies in the KJV. This noun refers to a large body of military personnel. This word primarily refers to a large number of people assemb assembled for military purposes. So we see what God is saying. The angels and celestial bodies, including the sun, the moon, and the stars, are called the host, or Saba, S-A-B-A, of the heavens. In the Old Testament, Yahweh, or Jehovah, has the title Yahweh of hosts. That's where we hear Sabaoth. Okay, see 1 Samuel 17, 45, which conveys an image that God is king of the heavens. His rulership encompasses every cosmic force, both heavenly and earthly. God is the supreme ruler who leads the heavenly hosts to wage war for his people against enemies and earthly empires. So that's what we see is going on. Israel's also called the armies of Jehovah. Okay, and we see this is all from um, the Lexham Theological Word Book. So that's when we see divisions and armies, we're seeing that God is getting ready to assemble a military campaign against Pharaoh and all the people in his land. All right, let's continue. It says, and my people, the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by great judgment. So our note says the descriptions here in verse four foreshadow the plagues that God will cast upon Egypt since the, okay we already read that um yeah we read that so let's continue with verse five and the Egyptians shall know that I am Jehovah when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and I shall bring the children of Israel out from among them so God isn't just doing this to be doing this he also wants the Egyptians to know who he is that he is the Jehovah, he is yod He vav He. he is the one and only supreme, su supreme divine being. He is God. All right, so we see that. So we continue on. Let's look at our note. I am Jehovah or Yahweh. Pharaoh has not shown reverence for Jehovah. Here, his earlier question that we saw in five, Read that with me. And Pharaoh said, who is Jehovah or Yahweh or Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I don't know Jehovah, nor am I going to let Israel go. You know, you see his his arrogance. And then it says here, his earlier question, who is Jehovah or Yahweh will be answered. God will use Pharaoh's hard heart to reveal his identity to Pharaoh and the nation of Egypt. You know, so even here, I even see, it seems to me, this is just my opinion, this isn't the word that, it's not that he's just even just being just harsh to be harsh. I think it, it seems, this is my opinion, not the word, that God even cares for Egypt to, to reveal himself, you know, so they could turn away from their idolatry and the worship of their false gods. All right, so um, let's continue with verse six. So we see that in Moses and Aaron did as Jehovah commanded them. It says, so they did. So that's powerful right there. A command comes, you know, Moses, remember in, in previous, uh, the previous chapters, he's debating with God. Well, who am I? You know, I can't speak. Um, who am I to go to the children of Israel? We see all of that. But here in verse six, we see, and Moses and Aaron did. 
So that's a lesson in transformation, how there might be days where we're wrestling with God, we're wrestling with what he's telling us to do. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, we get to a place where we go and do. Okay. All right. So let's continue with verse seven. Now Moses or Moshe, we get the ages was 80 years old and Aaron 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. I mean, that's powerful right there. The showing that, you know, God, he, he's not limited by age the way people limit us by age. Okay. So let's look at the note in verse seven. They spoke to Pharaoh, though this is Moses's second meeting with Pharaoh. Remember he met with him in chapter five. It is the first opportunity to show Pharaoh the signs. All right. So verse eight and Jehovah spoke to Moses and to Aaron saying, here's his instructions. When Pharaoh speaks to you saying, show a miracle for yourselves, then you shall say to Aaron, take your rod and throw it before Pharaoh and let it become a serpent. So now check that out. This is the second time that this rod or staff is becoming a serpent. Remember when God was talking to Moses, he told him to throw it down and it became a serpent. So verse 10, so Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and they did so. And Jehovah commanded as, as com, uh, Jehovah commanded. So again, we see their obedience. Okay. They did it as he commanded. And Aaron threw his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. But Pharaoh also called the wise men and the practicers of witchcraft and they, the magicians of Egypt, also did so with their magic. What does KJV say? Let's find uh, verse 11. Okay, let's scroll up to verse 11. And by the way, you guys, what you see on the screen is what they call an interlinear. And that's where the, um, I've talked about this before in the last video, where you have the English words and then you have the Hebrew or, or Greek text, depending upon whether you're in the Old or New Testament, and you see the actual words, how it would look in the actual scroll or manuscript. Okay. So it reads in the KJV, the KJV, sorry guys, in the KJV, then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. Now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchant enchantments. Okay. So we see, so let's just see if we can find, um, let's take a look at the cross references here. We have Genesis 41, eight, and it came to be in the morning that his spirit was moved and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men and Pharaoh related to them, his dreams. So we see he's got a habit of calling. Pharaoh has a habit of calling for these, um, magicians. And then we see, um, another cross reference. Let's take a look at this. We're not going to look at all of these. So we see in, um, let's see, 12 here, it says, and they, each one threw down his rod and became serpents, but the rods, so we're going to read that in a second. And then we have, um, second Thessalonians two and nine. This is interesting. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power and signs and wonders of falsehood. So what does that establish? We see in this chapter that the enemy can produce signs. He can produce wonders, right? So the signs and the wonders do not establish whether what spirit that person is of. Okay. All right. So we're going to continue on. Let's go back to the translation that I'm in. Remember we're in the scriptures translation and so it says that they, he called them and they performed their magic. Now picking up at verse 12 and they, each one threw down his rod and they became serpents, but the rod of Aaron swallowed up their rods and Pharaoh's heart was strengthened or hardened. And he did not listen to them as Jehovah had said. So God has already told Moses, look, he's not going to listen to you. You know, I'm prepared. I'm preparing you. I'm preparing your brother. He's not going to listen, but don't be dismayed. 
All right, so let's look at the note. The passage, the passage of verses 8 through 13, recalls the sign God gave to Moses in Genesis 4, 2 through 5. Remember, and that's again when Moses is throwing down the rod and it becomes a serpent. However, the Hebrew word used for snake here is different from the one used in 4, uh, verse 3. Throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground and became a serpent and Moses fled from it. Again, we see how Moses is afraid of this transformation of the rod to the ser serpent in Exodus 4, 3. The Hebrew word used here, T-A-N, Tannin, T-A-N-N-I-N, elsewhere in the Old Testament indicates a great sea serpent. As in Genesis, this passage is intended to communicate the superiority of the creator God over all created beings, including primordial chaos, chaos monsters. So they're saying, according to this study Bible, that these were two different kinds of Hebrew words used for the word serpent. OK, they weren't the same. All right. So let's look at the note for verse 11. The Hebrew word used, used here. C-H-A-K-H-A-M. I'm not going to try to pronounce all these words because it's just easier. So just in case I pronounce it incorrectly, um, is the common Hebrew term for an advisor. So when we see in verse 11, but Pharaoh called uh, the wise men or advisors of royalty, whether skilled in ma ma magical arts or not. In many cases, the term overlapped with those possessing such skills. And then we also have the sorcerer. So in KJV, you will see the term uh, the sorcerer. So let me let you see that. That's in verse 12. Okay, so we have, I think I passed by it. There it is. So that is in verse 11. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. So we see it right here. And um, it's uh, Hebrew 37, 84. It's that word right here for sorcerers. 37, 84. Four. So let's go back. So this Hebrew term, M-E-K-H-A-S-H-E-P-H, -E -E is most frequently translated sorcerer. Comparative terminology in other Semitic languages indicates the Hebrew term used here may refer to one who concocts potions from plants or herbs. All right, let's see in our exegetical guide what they um, use. Okay, we see here serpent. Let's go here to where we see uh, sorcerers, verse 11. So if I click on sorcerers, I come to that same word. We see it here, M-E-K-H-A-S-H-E-P-H, -H -E -H, and then that's here. And then it says here, um, demon practice or sorcery. Um, and then you just have the different forms of that word. And so we see that it's it can be, we just know that that, the people that he called or his advisors or his sorcerers or his magicians, they were people uh, who had an evil spirit. So the magicians of, so again, we see that phrase, the magicians of Egypt, the Hebrew word used here, C-H-A-R-T-O-M, is related to an Egyptian term for a chief lector priest. Lector priests were learned scribes and oracles whose duties included reciting spells and prayers to appeal to the gods for advice. So these people are, are deep into this. Okay. All right. So let's continue. We have verse 12. We see that Aaron's rod swallows up 
their rods. So taking a look at the note, the magician's ability to mimic Moses and Aaron's sign may demonstrate that they were performing a trick. While this is likely the case with the magicians, God's serpent consumes the Egyptian snakes and returns to the form of Moses's rod. The snake's consumption of the others demonstrate the supremacy of the sign of Moses and Aaron over the deed of the magicians. All right, so here we go. We see in verse 13, and Pharaoh's heart was strengthened and he did not listen to them as he had said. So let's take a look at our note here. It says, if we look this up, let's see if we can look this up, this term strengthen. Let's take a look back again. Is that verse 13? Strengthen in the KJV. Let's see what it says again. There it is. And he hardened. Okay. Hardened. So instead of strengthen, you will see harden. So it is the Hebrew entry in Strong's 2388. And it means that's why my translation has tr strengthened because it means to be strong, strengthen, harden, take hold of. Okay. So that's why you see harden in the KJV, strengthen in the translation that I am actually using. Okay. And so it says that to be strong, strengthen, harden, take hold of this verb is found 290 times in the Old Testament. The root also exists in Aramaic and Aramaic. Arabic. The word first occurs in Genesis 41, 56, and the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. Uh, the strong form of the verb is used in Exodus 4, 21. I will harden his or Pharaoh's heart. This statement is found eight times. Four times we read Pharaoh's heart was hard. And that's in those uh, verses right there. In Exodus 9, 34, Pharaoh's responsibility is made clear by the statement. He sinned yet more and hardened his heart. Okay. This phrase, look at this text note from the uh, net Bible. This phrase translates the Hebrew word K H A Z A Q. So we see that form here down here. That's the same one we just pulled up. Um, for more on this subject, we can see other sources and it, it it's used. It indicates a will or attitude that is unyielding. So we're seeing how deep in Pharaoh's heart was. It was unyielding to God and firm. It stresses the will as being slow to move, unimpressionable, slow to be affected. Again, if we think about the, those who want to remain unbelievers, non-believers, atheists, agnostic, their hearts are very similar to Pharaoh's. Uh, slow to move. Their will is slow to move. They're unimpressionable. They're slow to be affected. Okay. And so it just is what it is. And then that's where we pray that the gospel will, will pierce their hearts and that they will just say yes to Christ. Okay. All right. So then again, we see again, that God is so supreme, even though these demonic powers can produce similar signs, God is showing when he allows Aaron's rod to swallow up theirs to say, you might can perform tricks and magic, but I am the God who will swallow up all of the demonic forces who come against my people. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for that. All right, so let's continue here with verse 13. And Pharaoh's heart was strengthened. Remember, strengthened or hardened. We already saw that. And he did not listen to them as Jehovah had said. And Jehovah said to Moses, the heart of Pharaoh is hard. He refuses to let the people go. Let's see if we have seen this already. Let's look at some more commentary on a heart that is hard. 
There was the tragic situation that caused judgment. Pharaoh's heart was hard against God. He refused to free God's people. God had already sent his messenger to Pharaoh on two different occasions, once to appeal to him and a second time to warn him. But Pharaoh had hardened his heart and refused to listen. He flatly refused to repent, refused to free God's people to worship and serve God. He was stiff necked, obstinate, hard, rock hard, unyielding. It was this hardness of heart against God. God, an unyielding heart that brought the judgment of plagues upon Pharaoh and his people. Think of this. Here's thought one. Uh, the very thing that brings the judgment and chastisement of God upon us is hardness of heart, an unyielding heart against God. And here are some cross references. Happy is the man that feareth all way, but he that hardeneth his heart shall fall into mischief, trouble, judgment. That's Proverbs 28, 14. Here's another cross reference. He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. That's Proverbs 29, 1. If ye will not hear and if ye will not lay it to heart to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you and I will curse your blessings. Yea, I have cursed them already because ye do not lay it to heart. Malachi 2.2 2. Or dis this is that King James. <laughs> or despise thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. But after thy heart, impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself or I'm in K KJV wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to every man according to his deeds or in other words a hard heart is um, not the way to go okay this is from the preacher's outline study bible and here's another thought there should be no slavery. So that's going to lead us into our next um, um, note because it says here that he refuses to let the people go. So there should be no slavery, no oppression of any people or race, not even a single person. You know, I don't like this, uh, this, um, but I don't want to mess with it, you guys. So I apologize for that. I can take it down to... Uh, 18, let's go. I, hopefully you can still see that. Yeah, it's not really changing the size much and I don't want to go out of it. So let me read it for you. Um, oppression and slavery are evil. They stand opposed, diametrically opposed to God's holy word and will. Governments, rulers, lawmakers, and oppressors of God's people come on, check this out, must hear and heed. God's word is clear. God loudly proclaims for all to hear. Let my people go, free them to live, serve and worship me. God's will is for people to love one another, not oppress one another. God wants us to love one another and to treat our neighbor as we want to be treated. Okay. Thank you for hanging in there with me. I'm just, I think when you talk so long, you start to voice gets a little dry tongue gets a little bit difficult, but Holy Spirit help me. All right. Verse 14. Now in the passage from 14 through 25, this passage narrates the first of 10 plagues with which God strikes Egypt. This plague was included in the signs God gave to Moses at the burning bush. So let's read verse 14. And Jehovah said to Moses, the heart of Pharaoh is hard. He refuses to let the people go. Verse 15, go to Pharaoh in the morning as he goes out to the water and you shall stand by the river's bank to meet him and take in your hand the rod which was turned into a serpent. Now take note of the courage of Moses in this verse. In contrast to his first reaction when Jehovah turned the rod or staff into a serpent. So he's giving him instruction. Now at the very beginning, he's, he's afraid. He runs from it. But here now he's going to take the rod in his hand. And he's already done this before. And he's giving him instructions to do it again. And then let's continue with verse 16. And you shall say to him, 
Yehovah, the Elohim of the Hebrews, has sent me to you saying, let my people go so that they serve me in the wilderness. But see, until now, you have not listened. So he's, talk he's talking to Pharaoh through Moses, y'all. Okay, I, they may serve me in the desert, Exodus 3.18. Uh, and see this note, and they shall listen to your voice, and you shall come, you and the elders of Israel, to the sovereign or king of Egypt, and you shall say to him, Elohim of the Hebrews has met with us, and now please let us go. So he, they're referencing Exodus 3.18, where Moses basically goes to Pharaoh and say, hey, God's basically saying, Let's, let, let us journey three days into the wilderness so we can sacrifice unto him. All right. So verse 17 Thus said, or thus said Jehovah, by this you know that I am Jehovah. See, I am striking the waters which are in the river with the rod that is in my hand, and they shall be turned to blood. Okay, so he's saying in verse 17, this is how you'll know who I am. Because I'm getting ready to perform a sign and a wonder, and the rivers are going to be turned into blood. Let's look at our note. The Hebrew phrasing used here, the verb H-A-P-H-A-K, literally rendered turn, plus the, pre the preposition literally re rendered to, typically describes a complete alteration, often of one thing into its opposite. See those verses. This plague may be understood literally the water as the, the water of Egypt changed into blood so let's see if we can see so there are some people who do not accept this all the way so let's just just humor me y'all and let's take a look at this note proponents of a natural now check that out you know here you see the doubt already who would who would need to propose a natural alternative but let's read it anyway i mean because what would be the point it's not supernatural if i can find natural means but let's read it anyway. Proponents of a natural explanation for the plague suggest the Hebrew means the Nile became as blood or like blood. So they're saying that it didn't necessarily become blood, but it became like blood. The Nile may not have actually turned into blood, but became the color of blood. Okay. All right. Whatever. If this is the case, an abnormally extreme rainfall may have washed. Look at all this stuff that they have to come up with. If this is the case, an abnormally extreme rainfall may have washed an abundance of red sediment from the Ethiopian highlands into the Nile. Okay, now let's keep in mind, nowhere is this in the Bible. But let's keep reading, making it appear red. This also would have brought high volumes of bacteria and flagellates, I believe, killing fish and creating a strong smell. This natural explanation does not minimize God's role in bringing about the plague. The timing of this event in conjunction with Moses stretching out his hand would still indicate its divine origin. So they're saying, okay, if there's natural means that we can, you know, uh, use to, uh, to describe this, it does not underestimate God's divine power. OK, I don't necessarily agree, but we're reading it anyway. However, such a natural explanation does not explain how the plague effect affected water and pools and containers not connected to the Nile. So there is a counterexample to this um, reasoning of natural means that the, the Nile River turned into blood or turned like blood by some natural means. Right. So there's the counter example right there. Then the question is, OK, well, how did the water in the pools and the containers also turn into this uh, red color? OK, the turning of the Nile to blood, along with many other descriptive phrases that coincide with the biblical plagues is actually mentioned in the Egyptian. OK, this it's a papyrus. All right. The admonitions of IPU 
W-E-R. However, the date of this manuscript, so this is an ancient man manuscript that we have, 13th century BC is too late for an Exodus date of 1446 BC. Furthermore, the existing papyrus is likely a copy of a much older composition, one that dates to the Middle Kingdom of Egypt too early for either of the likely dates for the Exodus. So they're saying you can't even use this papyrus as proof. But by faith, we believe that what this verse and what the scripture said, that's what happened. Okay, by faith. So again, that's just a note to get us to think, you know, we're going to hear these different objections to what we believe in God's word. So we're not afraid to listen. We listen, but we rely on his word, his word alone by faith. So verse 18. Oh boy. Um, look, did we cover all of that? So we have 16. See Exodus 3, 18. We covered all of that. So let's just continue with uh, verse 18. And the fish in the river shall die and the river shall stink. That's another counterexample right there because if the water didn't turn to blood, but just turned into the color red, then how would the fish die? Just saying. All right, keep going. And the river shall stink and the Egyptians shall find it impossible to drink the water of the river. Okay. Notice it says the Egyptians, it didn't say all of Egypt. It said the Egyptians shall find it impossible to drink the water of the river. The Egyptians, I keep saying that, Egyptians. All right, thank you for bearing with me today. Um, so we see that. So in verse 19, it says a stone, this plague affected more than just the Nile. So, and Jehovah spoke to Moses, say to Aaron, take your rod and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their streams, here it is, over their rivers, over their ponds, over their pools of water, and that they become blood. So all the sources, all the water sources become blood, not like blood, but become blood. And there shall be blood in all the land of Egypt, both in wooden and in stone containers. So to me, that just kills that last um, theory of natural means. All right, let's continue. Verse 20, and Moses and Aaron did so, and Jehovah, as Jehovah commanded. See, we see that theme? Moses and Aaron did so, as Jehovah commanded. Moses and Aaron did so, as Jehovah commanded. Moses and Aaron did so, as Jehovah commanded. And he lifted up the rod and struck the waters that were in the river in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of his servants. And all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood, not like blood, but were turned to blood. Okay. And so we see all of that. Again, we continue on. We get down to our note. We're looking at note uh, 21. So before we do that, let's just go ahead and read 21. And the fish that were in the river died and the river stank and the Egyptians were unable to drink the water of the river and the blood was in all the land of Egypt. Okay, all the land of Egypt. While some of the plagues did not affect the territory of Goshen where the Israelites live, Okay, no such qualifiers included in this passage. However, the text only records that the Egyptians could not drink the water of the Nile, which may imply that the Israelites were not affected. I, you know, I, I'm believing that even though it's not specifically in the text, but what we know specifically in the text is that the Egyptians were not able to, to drink. It says the Egyptians were unable to drink the water of the river. I mean, think about that. Would God um, create this miracle that would harm his own people that he's trying to um, have Israel, or I'm sorry, Israel is going to be delivered from the hand of Pharaoh? Would he strike their water? I mean, if we just use common sense, it would be no point. You know, if he would strike all the water and then even the Israelites were penalized. 
So we can just we can go with the fact based on what it what it states in the text that the Egyptians were unable to drink the water of the river. All right, verse 22, and the magicians of Egypt did the same with their magic. So let's pause, let's check this out. So they were able to come up with this 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 trick and they were able to produce that same sign that same sign so it goes to show us the power of demonic forces the power of demonic forces and it helps us even in this time that we don't just see things on tv or you know social media and see a sign and then say okay well they performed a sign so they must be of god no not necessarily christ himself teaches in the new testament you shall know the tree by the fruit it bears not by the signs it creates. So you have, even today, you have people who are singing, they're on praise, praise and worship teams, um, they're delivering messages, um, they're giving prophecy. Don't assume that they are of the Spirit of God. Christ said you will know the tree by the fruit it bears. Okay? All right, so let's continue. Um, Pharaoh's heart is hard and he sees that his magicians can do the same thing. So his heart is hardened again. And notice it says, and the heart of Pharaoh was strengthened and he did not listen to them as Jehovah had said. Let's take a look at verse 22 in the KJV and the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments and Pharaoh's heart. Let's take a look at this real quick. Uh, verse 13 and Pharaoh's heart was strengthened and he did not listen to them as Jehovah had said Pharaoh's heart was hardened neither did he hearken unto them okay as the Lord had said so in this verse it doesn't say that God hardened Pharaoh's heart it specifically says and Pharaoh's heart was hardened okay neither did he hearken unto them so let's continue it says and pharaoh turned but before we do and pharaoh turned let's look at our note it says with their secret arts rather than solve the problem the egyptian magicians worsen it their ability to mimic turning water into blood suggests the act was magical trickery however their skill cannot match the scale of what God does through Moses. So let's look at 23. And Pharaoh turned and went into his house and his heart was not moved by this either. Come on. I mean, my gosh, what does Pharaoh need? Let's take a note right here. Uh, this one might be a blank note. So let me go on. That might, that's just showing the highlighting of that. If you want to go ahead and highlight that. And so let's look at it again. Check this out. He went into his house. <laughs> I mean, I, can you just imagine that? And his heart was not moved by this either. The purpose, so Pharaoh and judgment, the purpose of the judgment was to prove that God is the Lord, the God of salvation, redemption, and deliverance, the only living and true God. Pharaoh worshiped false gods, but even more than this, Pharaoh himself was considered a god in Egypt. He held supreme power over the land and people. Pharaoh even thought of himself as a god, as the molder and maker of Egypt and its people. He no doubt felt what so many people feel about themselves today, that he determined his own fate and the fate of his people, their lives, comfort, welfare, and destiny. Pharaoh had earlier declared, I do not know the Lord. Now God was going to help Pharaoh know the Lord, just who God is. Pharaoh was to learn that neither he nor any other idol were true gods. They were nothing in the face of God himself, nothing but the mere creation of man's imagination. God was going to prove that he and he alone is the Lord, the God of redemption, the only God who can truly save and deliver man, that he and he alone is the only living and true God. 
So, man, that's powerful right there, especially during our times when we look to elections and political figures and all of that. We see an example of a king that the people look to, not the Israelites, but the Egyptians look to as the savior, you know, which we tend to do even now. If we can only get this person and that person. Well, maybe we need to remember that it is God and God alone who saves. There is only one true God, there's only one true divine being who's considered the Alpha and the Omega. So let's take a look at some cross references. As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Psalm 42, 1 through 2. My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. That's Psalm 84 and 2. I, Darius, make a decree decree then in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel for he is the living God and steadfast forever and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall be even unto the end that's Daniel 6 26 and Paul and Barnabas saying sirs why do ye these things we also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that ye shall should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are, are therein. Act 14, 15. For they themselves should show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. First Thessalonians 1 and 9. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Hebrews 10 and 31. Here's the thought. The earth is filled with the remains of men who thought they could fill the role, role of God in their lives, mold and make their own lives, blaze their own path in life, determine their own destiny and fate, and set their own future and success. So we could say today, that there is a disease of Pharaoh that goes throughout the earth. There is a disease of Pharaoh that even tries to permeate true believers. There is a disease of Pharaoh that is existing in unbelievers, in atheists, those who harden their hearts towards God and reject all that they see. They reject his wonders. They reject his signs. They reject the evidence of who he is in creation. So let's continue. This is a power packed chapter, y'all. If we were to just read it on the surface, there's no way that we could unfold uh, all of the meaning and application. Thereby, the reason why we have slowed this train down and we read one chapter and we meditate on one chapter, we chew on one chapter, we allow the Holy Spirit in his power to give us the ministry of the word. So let's look at the last verse verses 24 and 25 and all the Egyptians again notice Egyptians not all the people all the Egyptians dug all around the river for water to drink for they were unable to drink the water of the river and seven days were completed after Jehovah had struck the river so we see y'all we see we see we see and so we've looked at some cross references um, you could take a look at some cross references as well on your own but this wraps up exodus chapter 7 get ready remember on your free time if you want to read uh, psalm 59 all of it and then because it really has some um, relationship there between Psalm 59, David, what he was going through, and what we see here with Moses. See if you can make some connections. But be ready to read uh, Exodus chapter 8. Be blessed and may you prosper. May your hands prosper in all that you put your hand to. In Christ's name, amen. 
Okay, everybody. So this brings us to our close in this video in this uh, teaching for today. And so we're going to look at lessons and life applications from Exodus 7. So I want you to just take a look, read the screen to yourself quietly, and just think, pause if you need to, um, as you just consider some of these life applications. <music> 